everybody for uh, joining us. It is a cold winter afternoon. Uh, I hope you all have a cup of tea and, and ready for uh, Peter's brilliant talk. Um, thank you for joining us, Peter. It's really a pleasure to have you virtually and thanks to technology, we can, we can have, have you with us um, today. Uh, so Peter um, started his uh, career um, as a PhD student at the Donders um, Institute in the Netherlands uh, and worked with uh, Floris de Lang and then from there moved uh, to the US to do his postdoc uh, with Nick Dirk Brown, uh, started at Princeton and then moved with Nick uh, to Yale. Um, and then uh, our, for our um, good luck, he moved back uh, to Europe uh, and he joined uh, the Welcome Center for Human Neuroimaging at the UCL, uh, where he's uh, uh, holding um, a, a, a Welcome Trust um, a Dale Award. Uh, and he's a principal investigator. Uh, Peter has done uh, lots of really elegant and exciting work uh, using cutting edge uh, neuroimaging techniques uh, to understand not only perception, but also how it's shaped by our expectations and experiences. Uh, so I, I won't speak anymore. Uh, thank you for joining us, Peter, and really looking forward to your talk. Thanks uh, very much for the introduction, Zoe, and for the, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to to, to talk uh, to you all today. It's, uh, of course, a shame we can't be in person, but under the circumstances, I think uh, still great to be able to give this talk to all of you. Um, before I start, if you have any questions for clarification, uh, feel free to just ask those. And maybe the, the more uh, conceptual big questions are better saved uh, till the end, if that's all right. But definitely uh, let me know if anything's unclear. Um, so yeah, like Zoe said, I'm uh, investigating how our perception is shaped by our expectations and prior knowledge, and um, really trying to um, push uh, human neuroimaging uh, to, the, to, to its limits to try to reveal the neural circuit underlying these computations. So that's what I'll be talking about today, and I um, want to especially focus on some new work we've done uh, in the last uh, year or two, uh, despite the pandemic. Uh, which people in the lab worked very hard on, uh, and I'm excited to share those, those new results with you. All right, let me start with a, a, a quick example. Let's see if this works, this little uh, video, which I'll start now. So um, this is a sculpture on the street, in which has, as you can see, a hollow um, uh, carving. And as we move in front of this hollow carving of this face of uh, Vincent van Gogh, at some point, you may have the illusion or the experience that the face pops out of the statue and is uh, facing you with the nose pointing towards you rather than being hollow and carved out into the stone. Uh, so here's a still from this, this video. And it's quite remarkable how even though uh, we know perfectly well that this is a hollow carving um, that, uh, and that we have all the lighting cues to tell us so, um, that once we face, uh, once we're looking at a face, we have this really strong tendency to see it as coming out at us rather than being hollow, so known as the hollow mask illusion. And the idea is that we have such a strong prior expectation that uh, faces are convex and not concave, that this overrides all our other uh, um, um, knowledge about this uh, thing we're looking at and causes this strong illusion. So the question that we're asking ourselves in the lab is how do these kinds of things work? How does um, do these kinds of uh, effects of prior knowledge and perception happen in the brain? Now, unfortunately in the lab, we use much more uh, boring uh, stimuli. Um, here's an example of a, a kind of task we've used um, um, in the past. So in this task, there's an auditory cue followed by a um, cloud of randomly moving dots um, where 20% uh, of the dots move in a coherent direction and the other 80% move in random directions. Uh, and then after a brief interval, uh, participants indicate what the coherent motion direction was according to them by um, pointing this line segment in the direction of movement they perceived. Um, and importantly here, the auditory cue predicted which direction of motion was most likely to be presented. So in this particular um, set, of, set of experiments, there were five possible directions of movement from uh, almost vertical to almost um, uh, completely rightward. And two of those motion directions were sometimes predicted by the auditory cue. 
where one auditory cue uh, predicted um, uh, 27 degrees of motion and the other one 63 degrees of motion. Um, and then in a separate um, block of the experiment, in the in both in the uh, in the neuroimaging experiments, we presented completely coherent clouds of moving dots that participants could just ignore um, in order to train a decoding algorithm. So to preface this for uh, all of the studies I'll be talking about today, we use this kind of uh, logic for all these experiments where we have an independent kind of localizer um, run where st the stimuli are presented and then we tr uh, train decoders on that, those data and then apply those to the data from the main task. And that's what we did here as well. But let's start with the behavior. Um, what we found is that participants were had a small but reliable bias towards the direction of motion predicted by the auditory cue. So uh, here when 63 degrees, so more vertical motion was predicted by the auditory cue, then uh, participants also reported slightly more vertical uh, motion in their perceptual report. Um, despite the fact that the actually presented motion directions were identical. Uh, we found this over um, uh, in two separate studies. So we replicated this effect as well. So it's a small but reliable effect. Uh, now what we wanted to look into is what happens in the visual cortex um, in the during, when you have these kinds of perceptual biases. <clears throat> and what we did is we used the um, continuous decoders called forward models or inverted encoding models uh, to try to decode the direction of motion from the pattern of activity in the visual cortex. So rather than using a, a binary classifier or something like that, we used a continuous decoder to give us the best chance at, at um, being able to detect small shifts. And using this technique and applying this to the fMRI patterns of activity from the visual cortex, we found that indeed um, the motion direction represented in the visual, visual cortex was also biased by these auditory cues. So even though in both these lines, the blue one and the red one, the same uh, stimuli represented on screen, the motion direction represented in visual cortex was biased to be either more vertical or more horizontal depending on which auditory cue was presented at the start of the trial. Um, we also found that um, this neural bias, the bias in the, the, the decoder of the fMRI data revealed and the perceptual bias were correlated across participants. So the stronger the neural bias, the stronger the perceptual bias. And we also found that within participants, when we, if we looked at single trials, um, the, the motion direction decoded from the visual cortex on a given trial was correlated with the motion direction reported by participants. And this correlation between percept and neural signal was stronger than the correlation between the stimulus on the screen and the neural signal. So the neural uh, representation in the visual cortex correlated more with what, with what people reported seeing than what was actually presented on screen. Um, and then in a study that we did, uh, that we published last year, uh, led by Fraser Aitken, who is now a, was then a postdoc in, in my lab and is now at King's College, and uh, Georgia Turner, who was then a master's student, is now a PhD with uh, you in uh, Cambridge. Um, they took this paradigm to the MEG, uh, because one question that arose from this, this kind of this, these studies and others we've done looking at neural effects of expectations is, is does this really reflect, as we think, uh, a modulation of early sensory processing? Or could it be that what we're looking at is some kind of epiphenomenon where uh, actually these, these predictive cues and the visual signals are integrated downstream, uh, maybe in decision making areas in, in parietal frontal regions? And then once the decision is made, it's fed back to visual cortex as kind of a late epiphenomenon. Um, we were not able to distinguish those two types of phenomena with fMRI because of its sluggish uh, response. So that's why we took this paradigm to the MEG and uh, used a similar decoding approach, um, but now we can decode in a time resolved manner. And if we just look at decoding within the localizer, uh, um, uh, blocks, we see that the first peak in decoding, so the first time we're able to decode the motion direction of these dots uh, is around 100 milliseconds. So we trained our decoders on that early decoding uh, uh, window, that early time window, 100 milliseconds uh, post stimulus, post onset of the stimulus, and then applied it to the main task. And what we found is that around 150 milliseconds 
post stimulus, we can uh, see this effect of these auditory cues on the motion direction represented in the MEG signal. So we see them more clearly if we subtract the two cue conditions. So the subtraction subtracts out basically anything purely stimulus driven because the stimuli are identical. And we see that around 150 milliseconds, there's a significant cluster of, of um, uh, decoding that where the, which reflects the, the direction of motion predicted by the auditory cue. So it seems that yes, early sensory processing is uh, affected by these um, predictive cues. Okay, so a very quick interim summary of this. Um, basically what we find is the prior expectations can bias our perception. Um, but what I want to focus on next is, um, can they make us see things that are not there at all? And let me briefly explain what, what the difference is uh, that I'm alluding to here. In these stimuli we've been looking at so far, these moving dot clouds, there is um, uh, um, a coherent direction of motion, as I said, and then all the other dots move in a random direction. So there's a little bit of ev the evidence basically for any motion direction. Um, so what might be happening is that these predictive cues determine how we weigh up uh, the different uh, bits of evidence. So evidence in line with the predictive cue maybe gets weighed more heavily. Um, leading to a, a, a representation that's biased towards the um, predicted cue. But what if there's no evidence, no stimulus evidence in the, on the screen at all? Um, is it possible to then hallucinate, as it were, the expected stimulus, um, uh, even though there is no signal there? So um, first, as an intermediary question to try to address this, um, what we looked at in this study uh, I'll talk about next is, um, can expectations on their own evoke stimulus templates in the absence of any input? So um, we've looked at this um, in, a, uh, in a couple of uh, studies. The study I want to focus on now was uh, led by uh, Fraser Aitken again, and uh, was also um, uh, involved, uh, also worked by Oliver Warrington, who was a, a PhD student in the lab. At the time, he was a master's student, now a PhD student. Um, and they use the following paradigm. Um, again, there was a cue followed by uh, some stimuli. In this case, it was a visual cue, a, a fixation dot turned either cyan or orange, which predicted whether um, upcoming gratings would be right tilted or left tilted. Um, and then on every trial, there would be two um, gratings in close succession, and people would have to detect a, di a small difference, discriminate a small difference between the two gratings either in orientation or contrast. I won't focus on the task for now. That the tasks were simply designed to give people, to make people focus on these gratings um, and uh, give them a task that's orthogonal to the actual queue. The crucial thing we were actually interested in are the other 25% of trials where, this, where we left the screen empty. So now um, there's still a queue that makes people expect an a grating with a particular orientation, but the screen stays empty and they don't do a task, they just wait for the next trial to start. So these trials were designed to try to isolate a, a pure expectation signal um, while the screen stayed empty, so no input. Um, and in this case, for this particular study, as I said, we've done this in uh, this kind of paradigm in a few uh, variations, but in this case, we um, wanted to try to look at this signal in a, a layer resolved manner. And that's because we have a, a specific hypotheses about how these expectation signals might flow down in a top-down manner to the visual cortex and then interact with uh, incoming signals, et cetera. And in order to test these kind of circuit hypotheses that we have, we need to uh, be able to distinguish the different layers which are differentially um, influenced by feed forward and feedback signals. Um, the problem there is that the cortex as a whole, in this case, talking about V1, is around two and a half millimeters thick. And that's about the size of a typical fMRI uh, voxel. Now, as uh, many in this audience will know, we can uh, nowadays push this resolution uh, a bit by using uh, seven Tesla fMRI. In this case, um, going for 0 0.8 millimeter voxels. So giving us about three voxels um, spanning the cortical depth. Um, that's better, still not perfect, of course. It still means that any given voxel will um, uh, contain um, uh, um, um, parts, different uh, parts of the different uh, layers. Um, so we're separating here into three layers, roughly meaning superficial, middle, middle and deep layers. 
and any given voxel will um, have a, a contribution from each of those and sometimes also of course white matter and CSF. So what we do is we quantify for every voxel how much of its volume is in each of the three layer compartments and white matter and CSF and then use a regression to try to separate the three uh, different layers. Okay, so what we start out with is just an anatomical mask of V1 and then uh, selecting within that anatomical mask of V1 the active voxels in our grating localizer. So just any voxels that are active when we present uh, a grating on the screen. And then within that set of voxels, we, uh, we, we find the 500 voxels that most strongly prefer left tilted over right tilted and the other way around. So now we have two um, sets of 500 voxels that um, prefer both of the two orientations. <coughs> and then um, we have another measure for every voxel, which is what I've just discussed, how much of each of the three cortical layers um, is uh, present in each voxel. So um, what we do then is we take um, all the 500 voxels preferring, uh, let's say left tilted gratings. And for each, all, each of those voxels, we know how much um, uh, their volume is in each of the three gray matter layers and white matter and CSF. And then we perform this spatial regression, um, which gives us basically a layer resolved pattern of activity for 45 degrees or so left tilted preferring voxels and right tilted preferring voxels. And if we subtract those two layer patterns, then we get an orientation specific bolt signal uh, across the different layers. So let me give you, show you what that looks like for when we just simply present the stimulus. So this is the 75% of trials where a stimulus is actually on the screen. And as you can see, there's a reliable orientation specific bolt signal in each of the three cortical layers, as you would expect for a, a bottom-up uh, driven signal. Um, you can see it's slightly stronger and superficial than the deep layers, which I won't go into now, but that's a well-known phenomenon in, in gradient echo EPI, which this is, which might be related to uh, blood draining from um, the deep layers to the surface. But now the really crucial question here for us is what happens um, when people expect to see a specific grating but none is presented. In that case, there's only an orientation specific bolt signal in the deep uh, layers of the primary visual cortex. So the deep layers of primary visual cortex um, represent which gr grating people expected to see, even though nothing was on the screen. Um, and uh, it's only true for those layers and not for the middle and the superficial ones. And this pattern, by the way, uh, just as an aside, is similar to something we found in a very different paradigm um, using these illusory Kinesa figures, where we found that an illusory triangle without any actual input to the eyes um, activates the deep layers of V1, but not the middle and superficial ones. So there seems to be something at least consistent in these two studies where a feedback signal without any uh, concurrent input uh, activates the deep layers of the, of the visual cortex. Okay, so back to our, the question we were uh, just asking ourselves, can prior expectations make us see things that aren't there? We know now that prior expectations can bias our perception from the moving dot studies, and that prior expectations can evoke stimulus templates in the deep layers of the visual cortex. Now, what we think might be happening in, in the neural circuit terms is that this feedback activates a stimulus template in the deep layers, which can then in turn modulate sensory processing in the middle and the superficial uh, layers. So that might be how um, these moving dot biases work that we've uh, discussed before. Um, but what if there is no um, bottom-up input in the middle and superficial layers to modulate, or at least nothing that looks like the kind of stimulus we expect? So that's the question we, we, we turn to in the, in the next study. Can expectations make us see things that are not there at all? So this was a study that we've just um, I just in, uh, finished data collection on a few months ago and are now um, in the last stages of analysis, but it's still work in progress. So any uh, feedback is more than, than welcome. Uh, this is a study yet led by uh, Joost Hasma, who was at uh, Cambridge before uh, for his PhD and is now a postdoc uh, in my lab at uh, UCL. And uh, we used the following paradigm in the study. Similar to the previous studies, there are auditory cues 
that predict an upcoming stimulus. So in this case, um, um, a low tone might predict you're going to see a right tilted grating and a high tone might predict you're going to see a left tilted grating. Uh, participants were trained on these associations in training blocks on a separate day, but they weren't told about these associations. That's uh, also true for the mo moving dot stimuli um, um, that I discussed before. We didn't inform people about the relationship between the cues and the stimuli, they were implicit. Okay, so then what happened in the crucial sessions in, um, in junior neuroimaging session? Uh, auditory cue, lower high pitched tone, was followed on half of the trials by a grating embedded in noise. Um, this was really um, a much more difficult grating to see even than in this example. Um, it was about 4% contrast uh, grating in 20% contrast noise, so very difficult to see. Um, and the grating would have the orientation that was predicted by the auditory cue. Then on the other 50% of trials, only noise would be presented. And um, as for the, um, uh, the meaning of the cues, we didn't tell participants about this. So we didn't tell them that there would be noise only trials. We trained them initially on fairly easy to see gratings and then started lowering the contrast of the gratings. And then when the contrast was very low, we started introducing these noise trials. So we didn't tell them there would be um, uh, noise only trials. And this noise, was carefully constructed to not contain grating-like signals. So uh, we, we generated random noise with the same kind of spatial frequency as the gratings, and then used a bank of orientation filters to quantify how much uh, signal there was for all the different uh, possible orientations, and then um, generated loads of these noise patches and selected the four noise patches that had um, basically uh, a flat uh, spectrum with almost no uh, orientation signal in them. Okay, so then we asked people to for two responses in every trial. First was which orientation uh, did you see? Um, we labeled these orientations A and B, um, and we switched uh, which uh, button responded to which orientation, so that people would have a prediction or expectation uh, implicit about which grating they might see, but not about which button to press. We wanted to avoid response biases. And then after that, they indicated how confident they were that they saw a grating. So not the confidence in, in the orientation response, but uh, how confident were, you, confident were you that you saw a grating? Going from one, I didn't see a grating at all, to four, I definitely saw a grating. Um, and again, as in the other studies, we had a grating localizer to be able to um, select voxels that preferred specific orientations and, and uh, generate orientation specific bolt signals. Okay, so what might we expect? What might our hypotheses be? Uh, so these are the results from the previous studies, from the previous study, sorry, uh, um, deep layer, um, the deep layers reflect expected but omitted gratings. So what might happen in this case? It could be that when people hallucinate a grating in noise, so this, this, these hypotheses are about the noise only trials. Uh, it could be that um, in that case, it's also the same pattern. Deep layers uh, are involved when you um, hallucinate an, a grating that's actually absent. And on the trials where you don't have this hallucination, where you just see noise, there's just no, or, no, no orientation specific bolt signal at all. Alternatively, it might be that the deep layers are involved in both cases because you have an expectation in both cases. And what determines whether you hallucinate uh, an expected grading or not is whether the superficial layers are involved. Um, so it might be that the superficial layers uh, are required because they um, are the layers that send feed forward signals up, up the hierarchy to higher level regions. And perhaps that's what's needed, both uh, feedback and feed forward signals flowing across the hierarchy. So these are two different hypotheses that now we can uh, try to test using our layer specific fMRI techniques. Um, first, let's have a look at the behavior in this uh, paradigm. So we saw that people were pretty good at doing this task. They um, uh, had pretty high accuracy in, on the grading trials, where there actually was a grading in reporting its orientation. And as you can see, they, um, they were much more accurate when they were also highly confident, uh, which is the left um, uh, plot than when they were not confident. So that uh, makes sense. They were also slightly more confident about seeing a grading um, on the grading present trials than grading absent trials. 
again, this makes sense. Uh, but it is uh, interesting to see that um, the difference isn't, difference isn't huge and there's also still a lot of spread in confidence on the grading absent trials. So we can look at that a bit more closely by plotting the proportion of confidence responses for the two trial types. So here, one, two, three, and four on the x-axis are the different confidence responses. And what we can see is there's quite a spread in confidence responses, both for grading present trials in blue and for grading absent trials in red. So um, there's more high confidence responses for grading present trials, as, as we've said, but there's also still quite a fair few of them for grading uh, absent trials, even though there was only noise presented on those trials. So if we just uh, cut that up, carve that up in high and low confidence, so uh, confidence at levels three and four versus one and two, then we see that on the grading absent trials, on, on, on average on about 35% of trials, um, people have reported fairly high confidence that they saw a grading, even though there was none. Uh, we also asked them after the experiment in a debriefing questionnaire to indicate how, uh, uh, how many trials that you think contain pure noise. As I said, we didn't tell them beforehand that there would be trials with only noise, but we did ask them afterwards. Um, and you can see on average about 13% of trials, uh, um, that's what people thought, con contain noise only. And there's, again, quite a bit of variation in this. But the right answer is, as I said, is 50% and only one participant um, uh, guessed 50%. So people, it seemed like people on average um, were seeing gratings when there weren't gratings presented on these noise trials on at least the proportion of the trials. So that's encouraging. Now, what about these, the effect of the auditory cues? That's more, uh, a bit more of a mixed picture and a bit more confusing. So what I'm showing here is on these um, noise trials, uh, how many of the orientation reports are uh, in line with the auditory cue? And as you can see, the mean is only just about 50%, so just about above chance. And that seems to be driven by a few very high uh, data points by three participants who reported um, grading orientation being in line with the cue on 75% on of trials or so. So what we did then is we split the participants on those that in the debriefing questionnaire indicate that they, that they were became aware of what the auditory cues meant and those that did not. And there were uh, seven out of the 25 participants became aware of what the cues meant. And those participants were driving the highly cue congruent responses. And when we look at the 18 participants who were not aware of what the auditory cues meant, they were just as likely to report um, orientation not in line with the queue as an orientation in line with the queue on the noise uh, trials. So this was a uh, surprising um, null effect to us. It seems that the queue, auditory queue, did not influence which uh, grading um, people um, hallucinated on the noise trials. So what can we conclude from the behavior uh, so far? People seem to have false percepts seeing gratings on these noise trials with high confidence, uh, even when there are none. But these false percepts are hardly, if at all, determined by the predictive cues. Okay, uh, we'll come back to that a little bit at the end, but now let's focus on the um, fMRI signals. So we use the same analysis um, uh, method as in the previous stimuli, uh, previous um, paradigm where there were very clear gratings and sometimes very clearly an empty screen. Um, and first we looked at the effect of, these, of the predictive cues. And what we found is as in the previous study, um, a strong effect of these predictive cues in the deep layers of the visual, early visual cortex, um, but there also seemed to be an effect in the superficial layers, even though it's uh, weaker and nothing at all in the middle layers. So um, as, you, as you see, this is an uh, effect in V2. All, in this study, all the um, interesting effects happen in V2 and V1, uh, did not have significant effects. Um, I believe uh, we have to you know, make, double check all the data, and et cetera, to um, uh, make sure. But uh, I, uh, it seemed that all the action was in V2 in this study, which uh, surprised us initially. Um, then we, uh, we um, did uh, uh, realize that the gratings we used in this current study were lower spatial frequency than in previous studies. So uh, half a cycle per degree versus uh, one or one and a half cycle per degree. 
And that was just because we had the feeling that these lower um, um, resolution gratings were more, were more prone to false alarms. Uh, but it might also mean that therefore we were um, uh, activating V2 more than V1, given V2's larger receptive field and, and preference for uh, lower spatial frequencies. Um, but that's, uh, that's an aside. So these predictive cues um, um, evoked a slightly different pattern here than in the previous study, um, since the superficial layers also seem to be involved. And that may be in line with this idea that the deep layers modulate um, activity in superficial layers, and if there is um, uh, uh, input present. However, as we discussed, this, is, this did not um, uh, um, influence the false alarms or false percepts that people had. So what about those false percepts? Um, so first, what we saw is that on the noise-only trials where people uh, had low confidence, so they indicated they did not see a grating, then there was no orientation-specific bolt signal um, relating to the orientation they guessed, basically, in any of the layers. But on the trials where they had high confidence that they saw a grating of a particular orientation in noise, even you know, so, although there was only noise on the screen, there was a very strong orientation-specific bolt signal only in the middle layers. So this is was a very striking uh, finding to us because this is basically the opposite pattern of the predictive cue as you can see on the, the left. These, these, the predictive cues seem, uh, uh, do not activate the middle layers at all, but only the agranular layers um, in line with anatomical feedback connections. But um, these false percepts seem to crucially hinge on an orientation specific bolt signal in the middle or input layers other than the feedback layers. So this was a very striking uh, finding. And uh, to go back to our initial hypotheses, you, as you can clearly see, didn't match our hypotheses at all. We had been thinking about these phenomena and along the lines of, of feedback and therefore thinking about the eight granular layers uh, mostly, but it seems that the granular layers are very important for actually having a high confidence uh, false percept. Okay, so to go back to our uh, summary, um, Prior expectations can bias our perception and invoke, st evoke stimulus templates in the deep layers of visual cortex. But to actually see things that are not there, the input layers need to be involved. So this was a, a very striking finding that for us raised a lot more questions uh, than answers. And um, I just want to mention a few of those questions. Um, one, one question we have is, is this actually what happens in clinical hallucinations when people actually have hallucinations rather than these uh, more artificial false alarms in our uh, lab setting. Is, is this the case that uh, somehow in, in, in people who uh, experience hallucinations, they, these internal signals manage to override the input layers? Um, and one data point that we have that doesn't directly address this, but I think it's relevant in this context, is we also um, ran this paradigm online in 100 participants and we asked those 100 participants to also complete the CAPS questionnaire that rates um, their abnormal perceptual experiences in daily life. And we found that those two, uh, that, that um, measure of it, uh, abnormal perceptual experiences in daily life was uh, positively correlated with their average confidence on the false alarm, uh, on the noise trials. So their average confidence in false alarms. So the more of these kind of lab-based false alarms they had, uh, the more they had, they, they had a normal experiences in daily life. So it might be that we are tapping into something that is relevant also for uh, perception in daily life. Um, and then another question is, so these priors that we use here, these predictive cues did not evoke hallucinations. And they seem to be independent of the predictive cues, but um, is that true for all priors? Probably not. Are there certain priors that can somehow unlock or override the input layers, um, even in non-clinical populations? For instance, um, if we have if priors are, are learned for much longer, or if priors are uh, explicit rather than implicit, as they were here, or if they are hardwired in the brain, um, such as very low level um, statistical regularities, such as certain orientations being more um, uh, often present than others. Um, that's a question for future research. What kind of priors can and cannot override uh, input, the input layer signals and thereby potentially cause um, uh, false percepts? 
Um, another question that we have is where does this middle layer signal come from? So um, as I said, we've mostly been thinking in terms of top-down signals, but maybe this is something different. Maybe these are in, um, just local fluctuations uh, going on in the in the middle layers in V V1 or maybe in uh, sorry V2 in this case, or maybe fluctuations in V1 that then are sent on to V2 in this case to the middle layers. Um, it might be that uh, uh, the brain, of course, just has noise going on in the background, and whatever, um, um, but that, whether that noise looks more like left tilted or right tilted grating in, in terms of neural patterns determines which of the two gratings people uh, falsely perceive. Um, and we have some evidence that, that, that might be in line with that from an, a previous study um, using fMRI that was not layer specific where we, we found that the bolt signal just before the presentation of a, a noise stimulus uh, could predict whether people would have a false alarm or not. Basically, when the bolt signal was higher in neurons tuned to the, exp uh, the expected orientation and the non-expected orientation, then people were more likely to falsely perceive that expected, a uh, grating of that expected orientation. Now, of course, this is uh, fMRI, so not the best method for looking at time-resolved neural signals. Uh, and therefore, Yoast is now uh, collecting data on an MEG version of this study, which we're very excited about to, to try to, um, to look at the temporal dynamics underlying these false percepts. All right, that was um, what I wanted to say about the visual cortex studies. Let's see, I think I have about 10 minutes left, which is great because I'd like to um, switch to a different question that we, we're trying to address in another research line in the lab, um, which is where do these expectation signals come from? Um, so, so far we've been looking at a visual system, but these kinds of expectation manipulations that we've used are often multimodal, um, arbitrary cues, uh, such as you know, an auditory cue predicting a visual stimulus and visual cortex can't resolve that on its own. So where do these um, expectation signals come from? And uh, the way we've been thinking about it um, is that it would have to be from a brain region that receives input from multiple modalities. It also has to send feedback, namely predictions back to those sensory modalities and uh, be able to learn statistical regularities between inputs quickly. So we've been studying the hippocampus in this uh, context as a candidate for uh, learning and, and sending um, uh, these perceptual prediction signals. Um, so basically our uh, hypothesis we started out with is that maybe when an, a predictive cue is presented, in this case an auditory tone, the hippocampus uses its pattern completion mechanisms to retrieve the whole event, namely the auditory cue followed by the visual stimulus, and then sends a prediction of that visual stimulus back to the visual cortex. So that's our speculative hypothesis. Um, and the way we've been looking uh, looking into this is using these um, expectations about these complex shapes, which are um, drawn from a continuous shape morph, and then taking five discrete samples along that continuous shape space, um, with an auditory cue, uh, with two auditory cues predicting two of these shapes with seventy five percent validity, and then on twenty five percent of the trials, uh, people see the unexpected shape. So that's what happens in the in the main runs of the task of prediction runs, uh, and then uh, people uh, see two shapes in every trial, which are actually which are either identical or slightly different from each other, and they are asked to indicate uh, whether the two shapes are same or different. Again, this is mostly a cover task to get people to pay attention to the shapes, uh, but it's orthogonal to the predictive cues. Okay, um, and then we also had localizer runs where all five shapes were presented equally often. Again, this was purely to train a, a decoding algorithm to uh, distinguish the different shapes based on the neural signals. Now, I won't go into the details of the decoding model, but as in the moving dots case, we, uh, we used a continuous decoder rather than a binary classifier, um, which basically created this evidence curve or decoding curve uh, for a particular uh, uh, fMRI pattern of activity. Um, and in this case, you can see that it peaks at the correct shape in here as well. So in this, in this case, on this data from the primary visual cortex, it's able to decode which shape was presented, presented on the screen. What we're really interested in here, of course, is the hippocampus, as I said. Uh, 
So what happens in the hippocampus when you uh, uh, predict a certain shape and that shape is also presented. So in this case, the, the second shape out of the five. In that case, the pattern of activity in the hippocampus um, looks like uh, or represents um, that particular shape, the one that was both presented and cued. But now crucially, what happens when one shape is presented, but another had been cued? In that case, the pattern of activity in the hippocampus reflects purely the cued shape. Uh, rather than the one that was presented on the screen. So if we overlay these two, you can see that the pattern completely uh, flips. And this is very different from the primary visual cortex, for instance, uh, just to illustrate this. So the, in both, in all these cases, it was actually the second shape from the five that was on the screen. And in the visual cortex, that's the one that then dominates the response with a small modulation by the Q. But in hippocampus, um, the pattern of activity is completely dominated by the uh, auditory cue, but a predictive cue rather than the actual shape that was on the screen. So um, to in order to quantify this a bit, uh, these decoding curves into a more simple measure, we, uh, we calculated decoder evidence for the shape as um, decoder evidence for um, the shape that was presented minus the evidence for the shape that was not presented, just to get a scalar um, value out of this. And then we find that as you from these particular curves, there's positive evidence for the validly cute shape and negative for the invalidly cute shape, reflecting actually evidence for the cute shape rather than the presented one. Um, and we can quanti we can combine this into a measure of evidence for the presented shape, which is simply the average of these two, which for the hippocampus is close to zero, and evidence for the cute shape, which is a subtraction of the two. And that in this case, in the hippocampus is a significantly positive signal. So the hippocampus seems to here represent predicted rather than presented shapes. Um, and this is a very striking finding. We thought that uh, um, as uh, for many of the studies we've done on the hippocampus raised more, more, more uh, questions than answers. So um, what we've set out to do in the last couple of years is, is try to figure out how the hippocampus builds these representations, um, how they uh, arise during learning. Um, to try to get a bit more understanding of the mechanisms involved here. Okay, so that's what, um, let me just quickly give you time. Okay, I'll try to keep this brief. That's what Fraser Aitken has been uh, doing in, in two fMRI experiments over the last couple of years. Um, the data collection took a lot longer than we had initially expected because of the pandemic, but we've completed it now and, and are very excited about the uh, results. Again, um, work in progress, so any feedback is, is welcome. It's the same the design as for the previous hippocampus study, but now on every block of the experiment, people get new auditory cues. So there's two new auditory cues on every block, um, and then people do 32 trials, and then they get new auditory cues, etc. So that allows us to see what happens over these 32 trials um, um, of them being exposed to these auditory cues. Now here, uh, we didn't tell people what the cues meant. We just it was all implicit. And debriefing also indicated that they didn't become aware of what the auditory cues meant. Um, so all these effects I'm about to show you are implicit uh, <coughs> cue effects. So as I said, we quantified the effect of the cues uh, uh, by, by su subtracting the valid and invalidly cued uh, uh, shape signals. And what we found, um, first of all, in the hippocampus is over trials, which is here on the x-axis. Um, initially, there's no a prediction signal, which makes sense. People still have to learn. But then uh, in the second half of the block, um, there starts to uh, uh, emerge a positive signal for the invalidly predicted shapes. So the validly predicted shape signal is not significantly different from zero, but the invalidly predicted shape signal is. And that when you subtract these two, you actually get a negative prediction signal because the valid minus invalid here is negative. So this puzzled us and, and we thought, what could this mean? Um, so if we put it in a bit of a schematic uh, uh, way, what we found in the previous study is that um, uh, it's more like a prediction signal, namely evidence for the predicted shape, regardless of whether that one was the presented shape uh, or, or not. Um, but what this signal uh, looks like is a bit more like a prediction error, no significant representation of validly predicted shapes, but there is a significant representation of uh, shapes that were unexpectedly presented 
So you can see that it's the signal for invalidly predicted shapes that's in the opposite, has the opposite sign in this study compared to the first one. And just in case I didn't make this uh, clear before, I'm sorry if I, uh, if I didn't. In the, in the first study, the difference was that people learned these associations uh, and were also told about them before they went into the scanner. Uh, whereas here they learn all the time they learn uh, uh, in, these, in every block, they learn new cubes. So um, uh, that's the difference between these two studies. Um, so we thought, um, what does this mean? Because we expected something to gradually emerge as people learn, but we didn't expect it to go in the opposite direction of what the, uh, our for, uh, previous study found. So in thinking about this, um, uh, like we have this negative going signal go from this experiment when people learn over the course of, of uh, 32 trials per block, and we had this positive prediction signal in our previous experiment. Might it be that uh, we're early in learning here, people are st slowly statist learning statistical regularities in an implicit manner. Um, and during learning, of course, you use prediction errors to update your models. So maybe it's the prediction errors that are uh, particularly prominent here. Whereas once learning is done, the prediction errors are not informative anymore. Uh, in this case, is the 25% invalid trials are now not no longer unexpected uncertainty, but expected uncertainty. And maybe then you don't emphasize your prediction errors as much anymore, and the predictions start to dominate. So if that's true, then we would expect this signal to switch over the course of learning from being a more like a prediction error signal to a prediction signal. So to try to look into this, Fraser did a follow-up experiment where we had fewer blocks, but longer blocks. So now the blocks were four times as long, 128 trials. Um, and strikingly, what we found is indeed the, the signal does switch. So uh, about halfway through the experiment, again, it looks like a prediction error, no evidence for valid predictions, uh, but evidence for unexpectedly presented shapes. But then towards the end of the blocks, it switches with the evidence uh, looking more like um, evidence for the predicted shape, regardless of whether it was presented or not. And we see that uh, switch even more clearly in the subtraction of these two. So evidence for the predicted shape halfway through there's negative prediction signal like prediction error. And towards the end of the blocks, there is this prediction signal. And this effect seemed to be driven by the, in the, by the posterior hippocampus. And then there you can see the signal even a bit uh, more clearly. So just to uh, unpack this a little bit more, um, because these are quite complex findings, halfway through uh, learning, so in early learning, um, what the signal looks like is no evidence for um, uh, expected things, um, because uh, presumably because there is no error, uh, but evidence for unexpected uh, things. Um, so only unexpected shapes are encoded. Um, but then uh, as learning, is um, more uh, finished towards the end of the blocks. Um, it looks more like um, evidence for the cute shape, uh, regardless of whether that shape was actually presented. Another finding in this study is that um, towards the end of these blocks, when predictions seem to dominate over prediction errors, we also uh, see increased connectivity between the subiculum, uh, one of the major outputs of the hippocampus, and the visual cortex. Subiculum is also where we found the strongest prediction signals in the first study. Um, and we think that this might be, it might reflect the fact that um, once predictions are learned, the hippocampus starts sending those predictions via the subiculum back to the cortex. Okay, so quite a complex set of findings, but just to try to um, draw some, oops, some um, uh, quick conclusions. During learning, the hippocampus switches from representing errors to predictions. And this may be in line with models of hippocampus uh, switching from encoding to retrieval mode as a function of novelty. So when there's unexpected uncertainty, it gets encoded. When there's expected uncertainty, uh, it doesn't as much anymore. Um, and in future directions, what we really want to do is to try to tie these two parts of, of, of basically two parts of my talk together more, the hippocampus uh, mechanisms and the, and the visual cortex mechanisms by looking at um, functional connectivity, um, ideally in a directional manner. So one thing I'm excited about that we just start to work on now is trying to use um, layer fMRI to look at the entorhinal cortex, which is a, one of the main interfaces between the cortex and the hippocampus. And we know that signals from cortex to hippocampus 
flow to the superficial layers where signals from the hippocampus to cortex flow to the deep layers of entorhinal cortex. So it might be that these kind of more prediction errors like signals flow from cortex to the hippocampus, whereas the predictions uh, toward the end of the experiment flow from the hippocampus to the deep layers of entorhinal cortex. And resolving the layers of entorhinal cortex will then allow us to look at um, the co communication between hippocampus and cortex in a, in a directional manner, despite the sluggish nature of the bolt signal. Another way, of course, is to use more time-resolved recordings, in either an intracranial EEG or um, with MEG, where uh, using source localization of, of theta oscillations, we might also be able to gain some insights there, especially given that theta phase is thought to determine the mode the, of the hippocampus is in. So we can see if theta um, phase changes as a, as a function of, uh, of learning in these paradigms. That's just to give you some ideas of the, the future directions on, uh, on these kinds of projects that we're, we're planning to take. Okay, um, I'll end here because I'm, I'm already uh, slightly over time, I think. And I just wanted to thank everyone who did all this work, especially uh, Joost and, and, and Fraser uh, for their amazing hard work, especially under these challenging circumstances. And also the imaging support team at the Phil who worked amazingly hard to, to allow us to collect uh, these kinds of data again uh, under these uh, uh, challenging pandemic circumstances. Um, and thank you all for your attention. Great, thank you very much, Peter. Lots of clapping. It's an amazing tour de force and really see, neat, nice to see that uh, research continuing despite pandemics and lab closures and everything. Yeah, thanks. Right, so we've got lots and lots of hands already. Let me see um, for questions. Um, Peter, I don't know if you if you want to. Um, um, you can keep your slides on. I can see everybody. Uh, okay, Nadine, please go ahead. Hi, Peter. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, cool. Cause uh, so I'm in my on my desktop and I don't have a camera. But so that was really cool. And it's really nice to see everything lined out like this. Um, like you, I was also very surprised by Yost's finding uh, of of this middle layer uh, representing the hallucinations. And I was wondering whether you thought that this might be because it is uh, V two and not V one, so it's up higher in the hierarchy. So it might be that the male, middle layer in V two does not represent only input, but also some kind of feedback that's then inputted in the middle layer of V2 via V1, if that makes sense. What do you think? I see. So you think there might be feedback to V1 that then, um, uh, of course, then gets fed as input into V2. Hmm, yeah, maybe it's very yeah. far-fetched, but just because yeah, it's higher no, up the hierarchy, I thought maybe it's possible. Um, yeah, it may, it's something, not something, it's, we, can't, we can't rule it out for sure. Um, it seems that in this study that all the effects, uh, all the grating representations, all the grating decoding is stronger in V2 than V1. So my uh, explanation tends to be that it's because of their lower spatial frequency gratings, um, uh, that that's why uh, this is, just all the signals are, are stronger in V2. But yeah, we can't, we can't rule that out, of course. Um, it still then would be, if it is through V1, it's surprising that we don't see anything in V1 itself. Um, I guess, but uh, yeah, interesting suggestion. Yeah, okay, thanks, cool. Great, thank you. Uh, any other questions? I am monitoring hands, um, or if you just want, you can speak up. Suli. Hi, I'm, 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 I'm interested in your about the source of the feedback. Uh, you think it might be related to hippocampus, um, but there's also some, other research talking about the prefrontal cortex being potential source of these sort of uh, predictions and feedback. I guess that may relate to sort of simple versus complex um, feedback, or maybe whether it's a short term learned association or long term learned association. I mean, I don't know what you think about that. Yeah, no, great question. I think I definitely don't want to suggest at all expectations or all priors are coming from hippocampus. I think a lot of it depends on the what kind of um, cues they are. Um, so from the very kind of simplest and most hardwired ones, they might just simply be encoded in the visual cortex itself, such as um, cardinal orientations being more uh, often present than um, um, oblique orientations. 
And then uh, there might be much more cognitive predictions like you, where you, um, you, you know explicitly to expect a certain thing to happen that might be much more frontal geared. Um, the reason we, we started looking at hippocampus specifically for these uh, kind of um, predictions is that they are, um, um, they are simple associations between arbitrary stimuli that are learned very quickly. So the, quick, the learning very quickly, I think, is crucial here, uh, which is something the hippocampus, of course, is very good at. It learns much more quickly than cortex uh, usually. So that's uh, why I think these kinds of predictions, the hippocampus may play an important role. But I wouldn't want to claim that that's true for every type of expectation. Yeah, thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions? Feel free to speak up or raise your hand. Maybe I'll follow from Suli's question to ask you a little bit about probabilistic associations, Peter, and what would you predict um, in terms of where the signals might be coming from? Uh, what kind of probabilistic expectations do you mean specifically? So more kind of like sequence of events um, that uh, potentially have more kind of complex underlying structure. Um, yeah. So we, we know from uh, from kind of recent work uh, about the involvement not only of, of hippocampus, but for example, um, uh, MBFC. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think um, I also I just have to say that the MPFC, I don't know as much about as the hippocampus, but I think for things like sequences, it seems like the hippocampus has a lot of the machinery to you know, represent sequences in, in lots of other domains in time and in space and in uh, replay of, of learned associations during uh, sleep, et cetera. Um, so it seems to have all the machinery to do those kinds of, of things. Um, I wonder if maybe the MPFC might um, it could either play a more modulatory role there on the, the hippocampus um, uh, or it, another uh, option, of course, is possibility is that hippocampus is involved in learning these associations, but then the actual top-down influence on visual cortex aren't directly from hippocampus, but rather from prefrontal cortex. So uh, it could be that the, the prefrontal cortex um, gets these associations from hippocampus and then it modulates um, the visual cortex. So we don't know, basically, we don't know the real, the, the circuit here. Um, and that's one of the reasons for um, diving into that more deeply by doing these, these studies of, for instance, the layers of enterhinal cortex to try to find out more about how these signals uh, flow, because that's just something we don't know enough about. Uh, one thing I just want to mention as a ch an extra challenge here is that, of course, we're designing our sequences to optimize a particular part of the brain that we're interested in. And MPFC is, is really hard. It's, it's, it, you really need to kind of optimize the your sequences for that area um, in its own right, I, I think. So the fact that we haven't seen the signals there when, we, when we've briefly looked for them might be to do with, with that kind of thing, distortion and dropout, rather than the signals not being there, which is a, an important caveat. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, any other burning questions for Peter before we all go to? The department's party for a mint pie. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, well, if there are no other questions, uh, we'll um, draw this uh, Zangwil to a closure and thank Peter again for joining us online and hope you can come and visit us in person soon. Thank you, everybody. Yes, I hope so too. Thanks very much for the invitation. It's great to, great to virtually be with you and yes, hopefully in person sometime. Thank you, Peter. Enjoy your party. Thanks.